I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. We're very much the stars of our own movie. And sometimes these are sad movies. And we get sucked up into the story of me. And the world constricts when that happens. And it's almost like the difference, and there's a subtle difference even in the words, but the difference between happiness and well-being. Yes. So yes. well-being doesn't necessarily imply happiness. It means you're well right now. Equanimity. Yeah. Once again, so excited to have Dan Harris on the podcast. Dan Harris, welcome. Wait, this, is my, this is like my third time, right? Uh, no, it's your second, but, oh yeah, it is your third. Yeah, because you did, first off, I'll introduce you. You did the New York Times bestselling book, 10% Happier. How many weeks was on that on the bestselling list? Uh, you know, I knew it was something like 10 or 11 or something It was like a that. lot. Like, yeah, yeah. That, that had some legs. Yeah, it book. had some legs to my It's still great selling surprise. really well. I yeah, mean, it does all right. It's like two years ago, right? Four years ago. That book's four years ago? I know. We're getting old, man. What the hell? Um, and then your your ten percent happier app you came on when you first yeah. developed that. Oh yeah, right, 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 right. And uh, we'll talk about that a little more today. Uh, very excited to talk about that. And you also are a co-host on Nightline on ABC, Good Morning America. You're you're an anchor on the weekends. Uh, you have a very successful journalism career. Ten uh, percent happier was such a great book because not only was it about how to be. 10% Happier, which is a, a unique concept. It was about your experiences with meditation, but very personal experiences, like your kind of post-traumatic stress from covering uh, the wars. And you basically had this breakdown, this panic attack on air, which people could find on YouTube. And, and, you, and, you, and you had some substance abuse that led to that, plus post-traumatic stress, and how you then, your recovery back using meditation. And you write about it so authentically and sincerely in ten percent happier, which I think is really the the key to a great book to have to have the arc of the hero, a story combined with something you want to say, which is here's how you can be a little bit happier. There's all these books that you want to be thousand percent happier or power of happiness or whatever, and you just say, well, I just, just improve things a little bit, and life changes completely. Yeah, my view is that over time, the ten percent compounds annually. Yeah, right, and and ten percent compounding. It's a weird way to think about the math of happiness, but of course it will double your happiness every seven years. So, um, and and over a lifetime, that's enormous. So uh, I like thinking about. I like I like you know I always say one percent improvement a day at anything you love improves you thirty eight hundred percent a year. And most people don't realize that, so they they live their daily lives and then. But if you just do one percent improvement a year at like knitting uh, a day at knitting, you'll be thirty eight hundred you know, 38 times better in a year. I like that a lot. Yeah. I and, like that a lot. And that works for meditation, I think, for as sure. well. All of the concept of improvement in meditation uh, is weird, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But just for me, I don't, as you can imagine, I don't mind 
interrupting, and I'm curious your thoughts on this before we get into your latest book, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics, uh, which you wrote with uh, uh, Jeff Warren, uh, and also you mentioned uh, Carl, Carlisle... Uh, Carly Adler. Carly Adler. Sorry, I missed the first name oh, there. That's okay. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Great book. Um, I'm so excited because I went on your podcast. Yeah. When, 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 how can people find your podcast? Uh, you can find the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. The question of whether, how to find the one that you're on, I don't know because I don't make the schedule, but we'll try to time these so they go, both go up around the same time. You are an awesome podcast guest. Thank I mean, you. I already liked you, but um, I, there were so many things that I had didn't know, especially the comedy thing that I didn't know. So we don't, And the don't, meditation thing you didn't know. From I me. didn't actually know that. Uh, so how, that how you, 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 this is evidence of what a good podcast host you are. You had me on twice and you didn't even really talk to me about your meditation practice. I guess because you didn't want to like uh, hog the airtime or I don't know. Well, I'm not, I, I mean, I, I have no problem interrupting and asking questions, but I also think everyone throws around Oh, I'm this. I'm this ism. I'm that ism. I'm that, you know. I'm an atheist who does transcendental meditation, or I'm <laughs> a Buddhist, or I'm a Hindu, or I'm a, a Sufism, or whatever. I, I I feel like what you do inside your skin is mostly personal. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's different from what you're doing, which is more telling your story. Which I I'm big believer in telling your story and what you did and then giving people the option to do what you did or not. Like when you you write about in Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics, you and Jeff Warren deck out a bus, the 10% happier bus or whatever it was, and uh, you go around and talk to people about meditation. But you weren't proselytizing. It wasn't no, like that's the Messiah annoying. has come, <laughs> you know, stop us now. <laughs> like... Uh, you were just, you were just like, what was that story? Tell us about that. I will. I, I, um, I would say, I agree with you that what you do inside your skin is largely private. Except, I would say what's different for me is that I, I kind of, I see myself as a public health advocate. You know that I came across meditation. It's like the first time in my life I've ever been ahead of a trend. I started meditating a little bit before it became cool. Although I should say, in your defense, I started meditating well after you did. Uh, you 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 ad adopted it uh, uh, pretty damn early. Uh, wait, wait, which we can hear about on on your podcast. Yes, uh, which is a hilarious story, by the way. I I, I recommend you tune in for that. Uh, but but I I, I start I discovered meditation and and realized oh okay there's an there's a significant amount of science that strongly suggests it's good for you. Uh, my personal experience strongly suggests it's good for you. And yet, when I looked at all the books about meditation, uh, they were pretty annoying. Um, not all of them, but largely. Some of them. Yeah, largely. 80% of them. 80 20 rule. It's probably something like that. And it's like you hear a pan flute in the background all the time, or the, 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 the writer is addressing you as grasshopper or something. It's it just. It, I knew it didn't appeal to me, and I knew it wouldn't appeal to people like me. And so, my only innovation was to talk about meditation and use the word fuck a lot you know like that i just i, I tried to make it uh raw and in, in my honesty and also funny and a, and a, and attractive to skeptics and well so that's why i do it not because i have so, a ton of desire to tell everybody everything about my internal processes it's oh, mostly because i think it's actually a good thing to do for you although i like how in your in, in this book meditation for fidgety skeptics uh you mentioned to your Wife, you know, what's it like living with your spiritual master? <laughs> I'm sure she really hated that. Uh, that One of my favorite things to do is to torture is, my wife. You know? I, I, I get that sense in this book, actually. Yes. <laughs> and I, I was thinking about the relationship with your wife in this book because, so she's not a meditator. No. And, um, but I like how she accepts your meditation. I've had situations where uh, my wife or relationship did not accept it and that was problematic um and uh, uh but you have kind of this nice banter with your wife yeah. reminds me of aj jacobs in the banter with his yes, wife it's yes, like a little yeah, bit of a yeah. i don't i wouldn't say love hate but like a love annoyance thing yes yes <laughs> so, uh, uh uh love to make her hate me is probably the way i have you succeeded <laughs> oh my god i mean like what's uh, your worst argument with your wife worst arguments um Worst arguments is when she has a, like, there's something upsetting her, and I am dismissive of it. 
Oh yeah, they that is the worst. And and it's give me a specific. So she'll have a hard time. She actually just came through a pretty hard time at, at the office and um, ended up actually leaving her job temporarily. And uh, she's a physician, highly highly trained. It was like she's an incredibly smart human. And what, what uh, kind of doctor? She has double uh, specialized, double bo- bo- boarded. She's a board certified in two areas: pulmonary and critical care, and also. Um, uh, no, we have pulmonology and critical care. So those are the her two. I'm expertise. glad you really paid attention yes. when she was well, going through. This is an school. example. So I don't listen. Like I have a way. I grew up. My both my parents are doctors, and some of the details of the science and the and the politics that they around the hospital. I've grown up with this talk, and so I think I have a way of tuning it out. And I think that I, you know, I, one of the things that I talk about openly in my books is is trying to sort of recognize the fact that I may be missing a chip on some levels and 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 working on my lack of empathy sometimes. Uh, you know, I don't really lack it with, you know, when I'm working as a journalist, I think, but, uh, you know, with her sometimes, I think I just don't tune in appropriately to what's bumming her out and, and I can be a little dismissive and then that can balloon into a fight. But, but you know, that's really interesting because your, wor- your work as, you know, at, at at Good Morning America, at Nightline, your, your your years and years and years of being a journalist, like particularly in in war zones, you kind of had to use that empathy muscle, like yes. in overdrive. And maybe when you get home, you're like leaving the yeah. leaving work at the office, and so it's harder for you to turn it on for your loved ones. That or the less charitable explanation would be that I'm a self centered asshole who you know. I don't just believe like, that though. Well, I, you know what I think it is, is that over time I've become less of that. You know, meditation is a great technology for uprooting self-centrism. And I think that to me, when I first started reading about it, is the Buddha's pitch is about, you know, the source of our suffering is being self-centered. And I was like, I am really self-centered. And I actually have never fully grokked how self-centered I am. And over time, as I, un, if I, as I loosen the knots on that, I find myself freer uh that sounds a little grandiose but truly freer to uh tune into what's going on with other people that's actually as it turns out a little bit counterintuitively a happier way to live especially counterintuitive for somebody like me who really was type a super um ambitious and as i said self-centered and um uh, over time i think as a consequence of meditation but also maturation marriage other uh, processes that where I've just gotten better at not being so much, you know, sort of stuck in my own head. Well, it's interesting because part of being ambitious is being a little bit self-centered. For sure. Because, you know, let's just take your, your you know, being a co-host of Nightline. There's, there's Nightline is a, is a big show. It's been a big show for decades. There's one person who's going to sit in the seat you're sitting in. You're sitting in that seat. 50 million people would have loved to have sit in that seat. You have to be ambitious and I'm going to use the word narcissistic, but not in a bad way. You have to be narcissistic enough to basically get that seat. You have to focus on your skills, building up, doing the best things you can, even overriding other things that maybe you could be doing better for your life. Uh, You know, a baby, a child has to be narcissistic to grow up to survive when they're younger they have to say I, they mm-hmm. have to start crying when they need food why are they being so narcissistic well <laughs> they need food they need to eat so they're just going to think about themselves during that time if you ever have kids that you know they're only thinking about themselves when they're hungry or when they're tired and f- forget whatever you're thinking about because they don't care at all um but you know i want to get to the meditation improving you know, this aspect of your life uh, in a second, because there's a lot of things to unpack in what you just said. One is, um, there already has been a lot of research in the benefits of meditation. Like, And I think part of that, the the Dalai Lama has been involved in. He's worked yeah. with lots of researchers yeah. all over the country. That's right. uh, and, and, you know, other people have looked at it. W- what are some of those just clear-cut scientific results? And, th- and then I want to never talk about that again. <laughs> okay. Well, can I can I... Because you said a lot there, I, I want to amplify a point you were making, and then I'll answer the, yeah. the question. I really like talking to you because because you know, I fun. have no idea where the conversation is going to go in a good way. So when you were talking about self centrism being necessary for um, you know being effective in the world, you're you are one hundred percent correct. I think for me that I meditation has helped me draw the line between sort of useful stress and self obsession. Mm. 
and useless rumination that just degrades my uh, effectiveness and makes me difficult to be around, both for others and myself. Right, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a specific example, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. After you have a conversation with your, or after you do a, a show at, of Nightline, wondering whether the millions in the audience liked you or not is probably a useless rumination. Yes. Probably better is to look back over the tape and say, oh, I could have done a better job right. there. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And and so when you look over the tape, it's like, how do you do that? Do you do it in a way where you're able to, you know, not get stuck in some rabbit hole of old junior high based insecurities? Or can you really be pretty clinical about what it is that you need to fix? Honest with yourself. I, I talk about taking it easy with the internal cattle prod that we do need an internal cattle prod to get out of bed, to be ambitious, to do what we need to do, to, to do what we want to do. But I, I think you just don't want, and there's no there's no magic formula here, but you don't want to take it too far. And you just need your own sort of inner meteorologist to tell you when you're taking it too far. And for me, mindfulness has been a really good tool. Mindfulness is just kind of self-awareness, this, this, the ability to see what's happening in your head without getting carried away by it. And that's just so valuable. But by the way, I just want to say, I think that is the most valuable thing in, in meditation. Like I think everybody buys those 80% books or they see stuff on TV or whatever and they say, oh, okay, I'm going to meditate and suddenly achieve enlightenment, have superpowers or read auras or whatever. And, and I think the ability to basically notice, like, and you talk about it in this book, separating out awareness from thinking. Yes. Think, your awareness is not the same as your thinking. So being aware that, oh, I'm thinking these thoughts that are really wasting time and energy. You know, the people don't realize the brain consumes 25% of your calories a day. You spend a lot of energy thinking. Yes. So if you could kind of like, if you're aware of the thoughts that are useless, which is really what meditation is practiced for for the rest of the day, then <laughs> you'll have much more energy for the day. That's exactly right. It's funny. I just came back from, I was on a 10-day silent meditation retreat, which is... Uh, Vipassana? It, yeah, Vipassana. It was very interesting. You know, it's a, it, I hate it, a lot of it, but I also love it, too. And But w w one thing that happens on these retreats is if you're really going for it, you're really trying to be mindful all the time, you, you end up not needing much sleep. So I, I, to me, and I've heard a neuroscientist friend talk about this, that if you are decreasing the amount of mental churn and suffering, you need less sleep because you don't need as much recovery. So I was sleeping three, four hours a night because during the day, I would, my, the, the, the volume of my mental chatter was way, way down the, the further I was getting into the retreat. And By the way, I don't want to forget to answer your science question. No, 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 no. We'll, we'll get to it because this is, there's so many different interesting things. So do you feel, so, so obviously meditation has nothing to, to do with ambition and success and so on. I mean, it has something to, to do with it in the sense that we just kind of suggested ways that could improve chances for success. But I think a lot of people think that um, and one path of meditation will take you to a point where you don't need that success or or you don't need to strive as hard. And I think that's a, a dangerous direction for meditation. Not for everybody, for but for some people. Like a lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, thinking about nothingness and, you know, oh, you don't need to do anything. You can just live on you know, your spirituality and your meditation. But Sunshine, the, yeah. yeah. The reality is if you have to raise kids and raise a home and, yeah. and, and live, uh, you need to uh, you need to, to do things that are going to make you successful. And meditation, which, as you just described it, can give you more energy, can stop you from thinking, going down rabbit holes of thought that are annoying, like being, oh, I just had this argument with the boss, I should say this, this, this. All that stuff is a rabbit hole. You don't need to go down. Well, some of it's useful. At some point, it becomes useless, and you just need the self awareness to know when you've crossed the line. And, and again, it seems like that's a, a not only a reasonable but a sufficient goal of of absolutely. meditation. Absolutely, for me, absolutely, and for people I know who started doing it and come to me and say how, what a big deal it's been in their life. I think you just need to. Uh, yeah, I think you need to set aside the kind of promises that we hear from what I call the $11 billion a year howling sea of bullshit that is America's self-help industry that tells you that there are silver bullets. There are no silver bullets. Set that aside. Understand that there are a variety of tools uh, that are available to you, including meditation that will help you with your well-being. And just, I think, when it comes to well-being... You should surround the ball, right? You should do everything. You should pull every lever that you possibly can. Because as I as I say in the new book, we spend so much time on our stock portfolios 
especially probably your listeners, stock portfolios, interior design, cars, uh, and no time on the one filter through which we experience everything, and that's our minds. And so what, 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 what works? What do we know works when it comes to the mind? Exercise, sleep, having good relationships, diet, and now meditation, based thanks, thanks to the science, which we will get to at some point. Um, and so I, all I'm saying is, uh, nothing's going to solve all of your problems, but meditation is a good thing to change your relationship to those problems. You know, and 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 again, um, it's okay to be ambitious and to want to achieve goals, and at the same time, meditate. You know, it's not like <laughs> totally. It's not like, you know, I I one time gave a retreat on meditation at a well-known place. I won't name the place. And um, uh, I wanted to title it uh, Spirituality and Money or The Spirituality of Money, something like that. It's a great topic. It, it is a good topic. Yeah. And I thought because so many people, everybody in America has is scared about money. So yes. understanding how sp- you can be spiritual and have that interweave with your worries about money is important. They called me back and they said, you have to change the title. We cannot have money in the title because it's not spiritual. And and this is a real, like, if I said the place, you would know the place. Most people mm-hmm. would know the place. Mm-hmm. It, it's a well-known place. Uh, I had to change the name. Nothing. So I don't really love the word spirituality. The problem is we have a poverty of language in this area. Yes. And so so we're stuck with spirituality, which has lots of embarrassing metaphysical implications, which... It's mostly part of the 80, of the 80-20. <laughs> yeah. But, but true spirituality leaves out nothing. And so you can't say money is not spiritual. Money is a huge part of our lives. Everything in our life counts when it comes to what I would view as spirituality, which is just your your approach to anything in your existence. Yeah, so, so okay, so the science. Okay, so very briefly, the science, it gets hyped at times. Um, and uh, I worry about that because I think that that actually primes the sort of pop, general populace for a backlash. But... I think we can, so it's very much in its early stages, uh, the the scientific research into what meditation does to the brain and to the rest of the body. Uh, but I think what we can say is that it's, the sti- science strongly suggests that it can produce a, like a long list of tantalizing health benefits from uh, boosting your uh, immune system, lowering your blood pressure, um, reducing the release of cortisol in the brain. And uh, the neuroscience is probably the most interesting stuff. So it shows that essentially when you meditate, you're, you're in effect performing a kind of neurosurgery on yourself. You're rewiring key parts of your brain that uh, regulate attention, so focus, which is under assault by technology these days, compassion, self-awareness. Uh, these areas of the brain change in particular. How do they measure compassion? They just measure the, the uh, they look at the part of the brain that they have most associated with a compassionate response to stimuli, and mm. they see that that part of the brain, the gray, the part of the brain, the gray matter, literally grows after eight weeks of meditation. They did, there's one study that I love that was done at Harvard in 2011. They took people they, they who had never meditated before, and they scanned their brains for a baseline reading. Then uh, they had them do eight weeks of short daily doses of meditation. At the end, they scanned their brains again, and they looked at three areas of the brain, uh, uh, one having to do with self-awareness, one having to do with compassion, and the third having to do with stress, the amygdala, which is associated with stress. And the areas of the brain associated with, associated with compassion and self-awareness, the gray matter grew, and in the area of the brain associated with stress, the gray matter shrank. Now, this is just one study. It may prove to be wrong over time, but it is in line with the general thrust of the neuroscience I've seen thus far. And, and is it is are the results enormous, or is it like fifty one percent saw growth, forty nine percent didn't show growth? Um, I don't know, and I think the other to so say there are so many open questions about this neuroscience. For example, what would the result? Can you can you compare that to what would happen if you learned violin over these eight weeks? What parts of the brain would change? That uh, that's a really good point. Like maybe yes. maybe the compassion center would change if you just studied violin, right? So th- that being said, uh, I have spent quite a bit of time with uh, the neuroscientists who are looking at this, and actually their degree of confidence. Th- they, they talk the way I. They taught me to speak the way I just spoke, which is look. Let's be open that the science is in its early stages. We don't want to be too definitive, but it does. Th- there is very the scientists are very cautious. The good ones. And I think there's a very strong suggestion that when you meditate, you are changing your brain in salutary ways. And, um, you know, a lot of the, just 
the last thing I'll say about the science, they kind of focus on two styles of meditation, and some of the results you quoted come from one style, some come from the other right. style. One is kind of the compassion, loving kindness type of meditation, and the other is the more mindfulness yes. style meditation. Yes. Um, there's what really intrigued me in your book, by the way, is the and I had never really seen this, and it was a quote you took from from Jeff, your co-author, but but then I, I may, really got me to think a lot, which is that you can do the mindfulness style of meditation. And by the way, all these styles that you're hearing us talk about, the best part of Dan's book, I just want to say, is you give these five to ten minute meditation suggestions, how to meditate, that focus on all these techniques and they're so easy and and gentle to do. You're really gentle on the reader. Like most meditation textbooks will say, okay, get a mat, find an hour, get in the lotus position, boom. Suffer. And then by you just eliminate ninety nine point nine percent of the yeah. planet. This book is accessible to anyone who just wants to try anyone who's ever said, I can't do this. You, if you can't do this with Dan's book, then I don't know what to say. You're a hard case. I don't want to insult anyone, but I don't know what to say. But, <laughs> Thank you uh, for saying that, by the way. I appreciate but, but, but what, the other thing is about the science, and this is why I only wanted to touch briefly on it. We were talking earlier about Tim Ferriss and how in Tools of the Titans, so many of the titans he speaks to meditate. Yes. And um, one thing that's interesting about Tim is that, yeah, he'll look at the scientific studies, just like we took a brief tangent into that, but he 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 says he said it on my podcast. Ultimately, the most important sample size is a sample size of one, which is you. Yes. So, people trying the techniques in your book, and if they try them accurately and thoughtfully, and really pay attention to what you're doing, or 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 in your app, you know, if you if they use the ten percent happier app with its suggestions, um, and so that really helps them to to do it kind of correctly. Even though maybe you can argue there's no incorrect way, there really is probably ways more correct than others. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, if you do that, you could see if your life's better in a month, two months, six months. Like, to keep a diary and see how you're thinking about things differently. And that's the best scientific research you can do. I've I said a thing when my first book came out. Uh, I, I might have said it on your podcast. I don't know. I said it once, and I've started. I've said it a bunch since then. Oh, it's definitely on my podcast. Pro- almost, almost, almost surely. Uh, which is, to, I just basically challenge people: do meditate for a month, maybe a minute every day or most days better to be five to 10 minutes. And, um, if you think by the end of the month that it's total bullshit, hit me up on Twitter and tell me I'm a moron. And people tell me I'm a moron all the time, but never for that. And so I have a high degree of confidence that it is useful, uh, just because I see lives change all the time as a consequence of people adopting this very simple habit. Like and, give an example, like, and you give examples in the, in the book, but give, give an example that's really impressed you. Of people's lives changing? Yeah. I mean, well, I just, just because of, by by dint of being a guy who's now written a couple of books about meditation, I get very dramatic stories coming into me about people who say, you know, they were suicidal um, and uh, embracing this tactic has helped them to turn their lives around. But I'll give you a more close to home example, which is my wife. So um, you mentioned before that she's not a meditator, but actually in the course of my writing this book one of the plot lines is we jeff and i my my partner in crime my co-author who the jeff is this amazing meditation teacher from toronto jeff warren i call him meditation macgyver because he's really great at sort of getting under the hood and helping people who are interested in maybe meditating but having trouble adopting the habit to, to get over the hump and so he I set him loose on my wife because I knew that there's no way that I could talk to her about it because she would kill me. And and I and when I first started meditating, I was very annoying about it and I almost, you know, got my eyes scratched out. And so I, I learned the hard way just to shut my mouth that there's no point talking about meditation to somebody who doesn't want to hear it. So I've never proselytized with her since then, but I did have Jeff talk to her and she told him all the reasons that she was having trouble meditating. She's busy. Uh, She lives with uh, a guy she referred to as the happiness guru, um, not in a positive way. Um, Do people stop you on the street and she, and and does she get annoyed? Like, Oh, she doesn't get annoyed, but it's just like, she lives with me. So she knows what an idiot I really am. So she, she, it's a little weird for her, but you know, it's not like I've gone out there and presented myself as a, you know, a a unicorn barfing rainbows, you know, like I'm not, I, I mean, the book's called Ten Percent Happier. I'm not, and it's about what a dummy I am, and I did a bunch of cocaine and had a panic attack. So it's not like I present myself as 
some sort of walking around in some cloud of impenetrable imperturbability, I am deeply flawed and open about it. So she's not super annoyed by when, when that happens, but she still knows that, you know, my persona at home is, you know, she, she sees me in a very 360 degree way. So she's aware of the flaws that remain anyway. So she, she listed the reasons she was having trouble meditating to Jeff and he really diagnosed correctly what would help her get over the hump. And for her, it was, um, making the thing less of a chore. You know, she somehow re resisted it because it felt like another thing she's supposed to do. Mm. And she's a doctor and she's got a three-year-old and a husband who's, you know, working all the time and, and she's got a busy life. And she, somebody sort of w implicitly, me, wagging my finger at her saying you should meditate just wasn't working for her. And that's uh, never going to work. No, it's not. <laughs> and when I say implicitly, it means I never talked to her about it, but she was like, just by dint of living with you, I, I, it's, you are a, a wagging finger, a walking wagging finger. So I get it. I, t I get it. It's a little unfair to me because what, what am I supposed to do? But still, I, I do get why she wouldn't want to do it. Jeff's created a special meditation for her called Taking Back Lazy, where he just encouraged her at the end of the day just to lie in the ground for a couple of minutes and enjoy that. Just in tune into the physicality of it. I love that Taking Back Lazy. Yes, it's beautiful. And Jeff's a genius. I mean, I, I, I don't say that lightly. And he's truly, when it comes to this stuff, he is a genius. He's yeah, and it shows through the book talented. how much respect you have for him. I do. And he, I love him. you know, and I've read hundreds and I mean, I don't know about hundreds, but I've read a lot of meditation books over the time. This is great, not just for your, and I just love how you always tell your stories and other people's stories, but just seeing Jeff through you, um, he has like some really amazing quotes in this book. There's things in this book I learned, and you, you know, again, you always try to keep beginner's mind, but it's very difficult. After you do something for a long time, you don't yeah. think you're a beginner anymore. Yeah. And yeah. there's one point when um, I always thought of mindfulness meditation, which is basically just to bastardize it, uh, you know, kind of observing your thoughts while you're breathing. And then if you go off into a tangent, like we always do, getting back to center and breathing again and observing again. So that's mindfulness. And then Compassion meditation, again, I'm going to bastardize it. Just feel love towards everything. Just totally bastardizing. <laughs> but I like how you and Jeff, and I'd never seen this, I always thought of them as completely separate. And often if I'm sitting, I might do a little bit of one and then a little bit of another, as if they're separate. You guys combined it. Mind, do mindfulness gently. <laughs> like Be gentle on yourself while you're doing it. And as a nice way to um, kind of combine the two. Yeah. Okay. And Jeff said it. So at this juncture, I just want to be clear. There are three things I want to, because you, you have a way of like saying 15 interesting things that all of which I want to comment on, but then we get on to something else. So there are just three things I want to say. Yes. So just, I'm going to say the first thing, which is in direct response to what I, you I just said. I promise I won't interrupt. Uh, no, 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 I love when you interrupt. I don't want to discourage you from interrupting. I just want to make sure that I'm on the record as saying there are three things right now that I want to say, but I reserve the right to add more. All right. So... Okay, one at a time. So in response to what you just said, um, Jeff's innovation in this book that was really new to me, and I think in some ways a response to what he diagnosed in me, which is that my meditation practice had a real sort of eat your vegetables, forced march, mm. at, grit your teeth aspect to it. And so Jeff was trying to introduce into my practice two aspects. One, enjoyment. He's like, you are allowed to enjoy this actually tuning into the ridiculously obvious but universally overlooked truth that you are alive and have a body is enjoyable. Tuning in to your, the raw data of your existence is enjoyable. And not always, but it can be, and you should allow that to be part of your meditation. And the other thing, and I think this is really what you were pointing at, was an attitude of friendliness toward yourself while meditating. Which is like yeah, that's right. He used the word friendliness. Friendliness, which is which is a less sappy way of talking about compassion. So so that when, for example, you're overtaken by some distraction, jag during meditation, like anger or desire for a cheeseburger or whatever it is, you aren't meeting the arising of these totally natural inner phenomena with anger, which is what I was doing. You are like, oh, what's up? I know this character. This is this is anger. And, and, and what is the value of seeing anger with friendliness? It's like f when you fight with anger, it just gets worse. 
you get into self-flagellation, it's close cousin. Um, but when you actually greet anger with some friendliness, the value in the rest of your life is enormous, which is that when anger ambushes you in the middle of a conversation with your wife or a colleague or your boss, you see it coming, you aren't owned by it, you can let it pass. And that is the judo move, the inner judo move that I think, for me at least, changes lives. Um, okay, can I get to the other things? Yes. I was say? Uh, did I answer your question? Though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, it wasn't a question, it was more of a statement that I really appreciated that he said that. Okay. I, li- I love the word friendliness. Me too. I never heard that in the context of meditation. Me too. Um, uh, uh, it really has, it, this book, uh, if nobody reads it, it's fine because it. what I learned in the course of this book has thoroughly changed my meditation practice and my life. So I'm delighted to have had the experience. Uh, and I and like you know taking the, back the lazy too. Taking back lazy is amazing. So actually, which that leads me to the second thing I wanted to say, which third. is... No, because there's, a, th- there's a, there is a third, okay. uh, but this is the second. All right. The third is actually, I want I want to ask you a question. Um, the second is... On Bianca, just to close the loop on that, because you had asked me for store, impressive stories of how things change. So if Bianca did, because of Taking Back Lazy, start meditating. And her practice is idiosyncratic. So she, our kid is just turned three. He, he's a horrible sleeper. And every night it takes like two hours to get him down sometimes. And I'm almost never around because I anchor Nightline during the week and I anchor a morning show on the weekend. So I'm either in bed or at work most nights. And now he's so used to her doing it that it's rare that he'll let me put him down. So she's marooned in this little nursery with this monster every night and and often just pissed that she can't do the rest of her life because she's stuck putting him down. And she co-opted that time and turned it into meditation thanks to Jeff. So she'll be lying there uh, just trying to tune into the sensations in her body, the physical, the you know, mm. the, the breath coming in or going out, however body's feeling at the moment. And then when she gets caught, notices that she's been overtaken by rage by the fact that Alexander won't go to bed. Or she that notices you're not home. that she just, or that I'm not home. Yeah, when, when she married poorly, um, she then returns her attention to her body. And I believe she's probably meditating more than almost anybody on the Upper West Side of Manhattan because of the length of time that she has to be there with her son. And so uh, the impact on her has been incredible to watch my wife. I've known for years that my wife, who has all of these stressors in her life, her job is incredibly stressful. She's got had some family drama. She had breast cancer last year. Mm. She we we had an infertility crisis. Then we had a baby and. So, so many stressors in her life. And I've known for a long time that meditation could help, but I felt very powerless to talk to her about it because I knew that it would backfire. And to watch her be able to metabolize her own feelings without being owned by them as a consequence of this practice has been enormously gratifying. How, what have you seen just with your eyes different about her since starting? So the way she handles the stresses in her life has changed. You, you could really tell it. There's oh, no yeah. BS. Yes, yes. I can really tell because I didn't know she was meditating. I knew something was different. So, so just to tell the story. So in the course of the book, we Jeff and I took an 11 or 12 day road trip across the country in a big orange bus and we met people. It's like the Parsons family bus. Yes, except for less cool. And we, um, the conceit of the book is that we're going to go out and meet people who want to meditate but aren't and we'll have them get over the hump. And so every chapter is a different obstacle to meditation. Like, I don't have time for this. I can't clear my mind. Uh, this is self-indulgent. And in each chapter, we meet, you know, like a celebrities or cops from Tempe, Arizona, or social workers from New Mexico. And they talk to us about what, you know, um, what's stopping them from meditating. And we, we get into the behavior change science. We teach meditation, blah, blah, blah. So at the end of the road trip, um, we took like five months to write the book. And then when we wanted to write the last chapter, we wanted to go back to everybody we met to see if they were meditating. So during that those five months, I never went and asked Bianca, are you meditating? Because I was afraid to do it. Um, so, But I, I was noticing changes in her. Her handling of stress, the stress in her life, in particular during this time, there was a lot going on at the office. And I could see that, you know, one of the things I, I, I've noticed in my wife, but in all of us, myself too, is that we were very much the stars of our own movie. And sometimes these are sad movies. And um, we get sucked up into the story of me. And the world constricts when that happens. It's like a sort of horse blinders. And um, I could see that her cloud of woe was thinner and less gray, and that she was not so stuck in the stories of... Uh, well, 
what was upsetting her, and that and that the that the upset about stu- about tumult at the office wasn't at the hospital more specifically wasn't she just wasn't um wasn't knocking her down the way her resilience was boosted. Well, I want to I want to ask you about that, and then you have your your third. Yeah. First off, I want to say tumult. Is that how you say that? I, I don't know. I, I, I always think, think so. of tumultuous. So I think tumult. Anyway. Um, I think it's tumult. Yeah, the hell do you I said tumult. I, I just was... T- <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I am so grateful to everyone who's been listening to this podcast. It's almost unbelievable to me. This podcast has been all about peak performance. How the best people in the world in any field, have achieved peak performance. I've learned so much from them. I hope you have as well. But listen, what would really help me, please subscribe on either Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you get your podcasts. This is so important. This is what keeps the show going. So please do it. It's the one favor I ask so we keep this podcast totally free and I keep churning them out and we keep on getting the best guests Meanwhile, you can also check out show notes at jamesaltucher.com slash podcast, or you can sign up for my newsletter at jamesaltucher.com. Thanks again. Given that, I like that phrase, you know, we're, we're stuck in the movie of our lives, and hers was very, const- often many people was very constricted by, oh, the office tension and this and that. Do you think as those walls started to dissolve she was able to be more affectionate or compassionate with you did your communication with her get better yes so i will i should say that my wife actually has a surplus of compassion we are actually quite well matched whereas i think one of my issues is is or has historically been and is the thing that i've really worked on to my great benefit uh, empathy and compassion is really boosting those muscles through meditation has been an enormous value add for me, but it was not something I came to naturally. My wife's actually the exact opposite. She's overflowing with compassion. But I, I did notice sort of an availability that um, she's just more available because the things... In what way? What do you mean by available? Uh, maybe the better word would be lighter, too. Uh, that um, in the, we used to have fights. This, when you asked me before, what were our biggest fights? It was about this, that when she was stressed at work, it was so heavy. I could tell that she was just carrying this like big overcoat of anxiety, invisible overcoat, but kind of visible overcoat of anxiety, this big, heavy load of, uh, stress and that it was very inner focused. Um, and, and so if I had a problem and I could shake her out of it and we could talk about it, but her default mode was to be kind of ruminating on things that she was dealing with at the office. And while she's ruminating and you're being self-centered and not asking her, hey, how'd your day go? It makes it worse. Yeah, it makes it worse. Yes. Cause she, could, was there a way for her to reach out and teach you how to ask her? Yeah, well... But did, did that work or not work? Uh, it got pretty... Be- I, I, these are our worst fights. So historically, our worst fights have been this mismatch where... She actually does, you know, I think want some care and feeding in those times. And I am angry that she's upset, right? Irrationally Doesn't it seem like a critical thing? Like when, you know, these are the times when she needs to feel that she's loved the most to give her the strength to deal with these situations. This seems so critical. How did you guys start off? (laughs) Uh, Well, because I would say it wasn't, it wasn't actually that common. I mean, when when you met. When we met. Well, when, when did this you haven't, disconnect- you haven't met her, have you? No. no. I mean, she's great. Dinner so, in January. We should uh, we should hang yes, out. Yes, <laughs> you. I think you would really enjoy her. She's she's. I think I'm having heart trouble too. So okay, well, she was she's more of a lung lung woman, but but heart. She can actually advise. Um, she's a hard to resist. I mean, she a she's beautiful. She's very smart, and she's really nice. She's really nice, and. So it's not like we had a tumultuous relationship overall. We actually don't fight very much. But our worst fights, since you asked, this is the general neighborhood of our worst fights. And so they weren't super common. In the beginning, they weren't super common. No, they never actually were super common. But when they happened, they happened. Hmm. Um, Overall, we have, uh, as you can tell, this sort of breezy, banter-filled relationship. That is our day-to-day relationship. Once or twice a year, 
the the conditions uh, uh, arise where the 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 um, dynamic that you described before uh, comes about, which is that she's at a point where she needs something. I revert into this kind of weird, stupid um, uh, obstinance, and it goes pear shaped. Um, and what I would say is breaking the cycle. I can see it breaking the cycle is meditation for both of us. You know, it's so it's, she's able to yeah. a be a little lighter about what's happening at yes. work. B maybe be a little open with you about when or or signal to you more that she needs yes. some affection, in and you're able to through. give it. Yes, in a way that gets through. And then yes, I'm less tied uh, tied up. Sorry, my voice went there. Less tied up in my own knots of whatever uh, inner stinginess. Um, that uh, we're able to come together in those moments. I'll tell you another thing that really helped her getting breast cancer because there was no way to poo poo that, and um, it was it was horrible for her. And I I mean uh, I don't it's it's hard for me to talk too much about it because she was the one who had to endure all the pain and fear. Um, well, not all of it because I was very scared too. Um, but I heard her say the other day, actually, she came on my podcast to do an interview, which was <laughs> very interesting. That's and a she, fun idea. It was, a, it was actually really fun. But she referred to the breast cancer as the best thing that ever happened to her. And I thought that was really interesting and heartening to hear. And I would say it was one of the best things that happened to us, that and having a kid. Because um, these experiences can either drive you apart or bring you together. And, uh, you know, going through inf infertility and then going through um, breast cancer... It was it was a lot, and um, there was it was very hard for me. There was no way, there was no back door on that one. There's no way I, in either of those circumstances where I could ever be like, oh, you know, she's overdoing it, or I'm going to be stingy about giving her what she needs. These were emergencies, and that once you kind of start breaking through some of those barriers, they don't really, in my experience, they haven't really gone back up. What what hasn't gone back up? The barriers. I see. So once you're able to go through these experiences, yeah. uh, what what about the reverse? And I don't want to say it's all meditation. I think it's part meditation. I think it's uh, you know getting more mature. I think it's getting to know each other more, um, and just baseline compatibility. You know, we it's obvious to me on our first date, frankly, that we this was somebody that I could do business with. So, so, put it crassly. And, and the reason why her story is so important is because you could, you yourself are like the scientist. You could see the results. It's not like just someone coming back to you six months right. later saying, "Oh, my life's completely better." Yes, because you don't know what happened yes. to them. Like maybe they won the lottery in those six months too. So, right. uh, but here's something where you you've been through minute by minute serious stresses, and so you could you, you're. You've put in your ten thousand. You've put in your ten thousand hours of analyzing her emotions, yeah. so you're able to study the nuances of them, and you saw them changing without even knowing what the X factor was. And it turned out the X factor was this meditation. Yes, I think I think there are several X factors, but I think meditation was one of them. I'm always loath to say, oh, you know, here, as you know, as I've said, as the, uh, leading up to it and leading up to this point in our discussion, I'm not a big believer in silver bullets, but I do think meditation was part of that, and it just again sort of just starts to pull you out of your self-centrism, pull you to, to allow you to see the bigger picture and to give you a different relationship to your problems. The world is, is impermanent and entropic, and we are not in control in many ways. And so uh, these exogenous factors are going to impact us in ways that we like and in the ways we don't like, like illness and our career, the vicissitudes of work and all of that, so the office politics and and so what meditation helps you do is just kind of navigate this in a more supple way. And that's what I was seeing for my wife. And the other thing that's really changed with her, and uh, it's interesting because for her, meditation was part of a bucket of self-care, you know, including exercise that she wasn't doing, um, mm. which was really a source of tension for us because she went through a bre breast cancer and she, you know, she really needs to start is taking she okay, care of herself. okay, by the way? She's fine. She's cured, like actually cured. Um, and right now, as we speak, the healthiest I've ever seen her. She's gotten really into exercise. She found a form of exercise she really loves, Soul Cycle, as it happens. And so we go together, and it's a it's a fun couple's activity. And I'm just so proud of how well she's doing. And um, and so I I think it's all part. Of, the meditation is all also part of a a little renaissance for her of realizing that she needs if she's going to be into taking care of other people, including her patients, 
and her kid and her husband. She needs to take care of herself first. And I love watching that. Yeah, and it doesn't mean, it's such an important thing because it doesn't mean she's not going to take care of you and the kid. In fact, that's often the best way to take care of you and the kid is if she preserves her own energy and, and conserves her own energy so she has it available for others as needed. Absolutely. And this, the, you know, Alexander watching mommy taking care of herself like this is great modeling. He's going to be fine if he goes to breakfast with me on a Saturday morning while she goes to a class instead of being with her every minute of every day. He's going to be fine. It, in fact, it's good for him to have just one on one time with dad to know that mom's going to take care of herself is a hmm. that's the mom I grew My mom was doing that and it was a great model for me. My mom's a scientist just like my wife and was very into exercise and so she's an incredible role model for me. You know, um, it's interesting because uh, uh, there's, there's, you know, one, one I, I never thought when I had my kids, oh, this would be a great idea for meditation. All the hours at night, you know, I, my wife would sleep and I would wake up with the kids and, you know, three in the morning, kids are crying, have to figure out what techniques to use to get them back to sleep mm -hmm. so you can get back to sleep. Never, I never thought about meditating during that time. It probably would have been very good. Well, what I used to do was... Um, I was getting into Scrabble, so I used to tape <laughs> um, seven-letter Scrabble words uh, to the stroller and just run around the apartment with the stroller and while memorizing these seven-letter words, which I guess is a form of focus or whatever. But it's training your mind, yeah, I, I, I got that better at like Scrabble. Classic <laughs> altitude behavior, like because I can only imagine what happened when you got into Scrabble. Like, you, did you start competing? Uh, at that level, I was at that level. So, uh, I mean, there's these things. Just a side tangent. I don't know if how into Scrabble you are, and now it's a like weird, it. now it's a weird game because with words with or whatever it is on Facebook, you I stopped playing because everyone's cheating. But um, there are these things called stems. The six letters, and any seventh letter you add will create a seven letter word, a legal seven letter word. So the key is to remember the stems, and then remember all the seven letter words that are created by adding a Z or an X or a J. And, you know, so these are important things that, that professionals remember. And there's, you know, hundreds of these stems. Okay. So so my brother, my younger brother, who's, you know, other than my wife, my best friend in the world, and is a venture capitalist here in New York City. And he, his name is Matt Harris, if you want to see him on Twitter. He is still mad at me because when we were younger, I don't even know if I was the one who made the decision. He wanted to use the word Yeti, Y-E-T-I, which is abominable snowman in in Scrabble, and uh, and we ruled it out because we said it was a proper noun. It apparently is no, it's not a, a proper. Word. It's a legal word, and he still brings it up to the point where every time I come to his house, his seven year old son Elliot comes up to me with the dictionary, and pointing out that Yeti is not a proper noun. Okay, so, play play him in Scrabble again. <laughs> With the latest dictionary, <laughs> and use XU as a legal word. Yeah, what what does XU mean? It's a Vietnamese currency unit. So, and it happens to be a legal Scrabble word. Okay, serendipity, because that brings me to uh, the third thing I want to talk sure. about. Sure. You talked. You you dropped a a fascinating bomb of uh, uh, conversational potential earlier, and we didn't pick up on it. The spirituality of money. I want to hear your rap on that, like because I I think there is. There, money is such a funny, loaded topic. It makes us uncomfortable. We get, but and yet we spend so much time thinking about it. And you, in particular, know a lot about money and finance. You've made and lost all these fortunes, as we discuss on my podcast. Um, and I absolutely think there's an enormous amount of wisdom from the spiritual world that can be brought to bear on money. So I just want to hear what your thinking is on the issue. I mean, I think from a fifty thousand foot level. You know, obviously, money is important. I think money is often a, a side effect of our spiritual practice. So, uh, when you were stressed and uh, abusing substances and not taking care of yourself and having a panic attack on air, what what is the finance? There's many results to that. There's a physical health result. There's a mental health result. It's also a financial health result. You're going to make less money. So once you start incorporating meditation and these other ways of uh, having energy, but in particular meditation for a specific reason, um, uh, you're going to make more money. Money is just a side effect of taking care of yourself. Now, you don't automatically make more money, but meditation, because 
let's say this is a naive way to think about it, but let's say the average person thinks fifty thousand thoughts a day. I don't know what the research is on this. I think people have said like fifty, sixty thousand thoughts a day. I don't know if that means anything, but let's just say that's the number. Um, let's say eighty percent of those thoughts are totally useless, and like you say, ten percent happier. Let's say you can make it so that. Only 72% of the thoughts are useless. You've just given yourself 8%, 10% more, 8% more thoughts that are useful. Some of those thoughts can be useful for making money or having ideas to help other people at the workplace or whatever. Just simply doing that, you're going to, in the long run, make more money because that's going to compound. Do you think, because there are people, and we, I tackle this in the, in the book, there are people who worry, though, that if they start meditating, they will lose the ability to the the the, the sharp elbows, the the ambition and aggression they need in order to succeed in whatever business in which they find themselves. Uh, absolutely not. I think that's a myth that they're telling themselves. Uh, you can you'll 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 have just enough uh, ambition. You know, first off, nobody needs to step on anybody else to succeed. It's a that's a scarcity way of looking at the world, and I think. Part of meditation is teaching your, your brain that the, that the world is more abundant than you thought mm -hmm. because it helps reduce that cortisol. Cortisol is a scarcity way of thinking. Oh, I'm in the tribe and I'm not going to get enough food, so cortisol is going to spike. So anything that helps reduce it helps you to think that the world's a little bit more abundant than you thought, so you don't have to step on anyone else to, to get to where you want to be. It's not, it's not zero sum. And once you start thinking that way and once you start casting those thoughts aside, it gives you room to be more creative. And then you say, oh, instead of stepping on this person, I'm going to help this person. And helping people is how you make more money. No one is going to pay you to destroy other people. People will pay you because you're the person at work who's the most helpful. So that's part of the reason why people pay you. But uh, uh, again, I think, I think having... Taking care of yourself and meditation is part of that, but a strong part of that frees up your creativity, gives you more energy to have great ideas, increases your compassion to help people, allows you to see problems that, and then the creativity to solve them. All of those things together, as a side effect, is more money. It doesn't. It's not linked directly to more money. Money is just like a, a benchmark. Uh, you know, people who go to work and who are in business. Probably the more they meditate, I don't know if this, this has probably never been measured, but my guess is probably the more opportunities for financial increase they have. I know when I've lost the most amount of money, I would stop meditating because it was really hard because I was so stressed and anxious. And it doesn't help to stop meditating. Only uh, the, one, the time I lost the most money, I went into meditation overdrive. <laughs> I would do like as many hours a day as possible and that was the only way to survive. Otherwise, I would have, you know, gone off the deep end of just stress and anxiety and who knows what would have happened. Like meditation saved my life in those in those moments. So and then I was able to make money again. So just by carrying me across that river. Mm. Mm. So, but, you know, again, what what I like in your in your book is that all like I've talking I've I've spoken to a lot of people about meditation and not like in a proselytizing way, but people tell me about meditation. I'm like, oh, I ask them what they do. Everyone assumes I never do anything because I'm just they they look at me, they think, oh, I'm this logical, scientific thinking, glasses, whatever. <laughs> and so they are lecturing me on it. So but I'm just curious. I always ask people what what they do. And but I think a lot of people do use these excuses that you mentioned in the book. Yeah. None of them are really excuses. They're just the tip of the iceberg for some deeper things going yeah. on in their yeah. life. Yeah. And I and that's why I like in this book how, you know, you say it's okay to do five minutes. Or so, one minute. Or one minute. Yeah. You know, like I'll give you an example that someone, not your wife, but someone like that could do, which I recommend. You know, New York City is a beautiful city to walk around in. Not the ground, because the ground's often disgusting. <laughs> but I always feel I don't know why this is in New York City. Maybe someone can maybe you can answer or someone can answer. I feel the rooftops in New York City are beautiful. It's like the architect was given, hey, make these 20 floors and they have to look like this. But then do whatever you want with the t with the roof. We don't care at that point. And the roofs are always beautiful. Yes. And so I think it's like a nice meditation and it takes you away from the daily grind to as long as you 
make sure to stop at green lights and stuff and don't bump into anyway. Look at the rooftops and notice how beautiful the most boring buildings on the bottom have these beautiful structures at the top. I think that's a, a decent form of one minute meditation. Yeah. Why not? You also, you, my brother, I remember years ago before I wrote my book, sent me some meditations that you had improvised on your blog. And one of them was like, um, standing in an elevator and pretending you just arrived here from Mars. Oh uh, yeah. Like that. So, so something like that. Yeah. Like, uh, like how would you then just like taking yourself out of the normal? No, actually it was this, it was this for, for, for that particular one, waking up in the morning and imagining um, that you just arrived from another planet or universe or whatever, so you had no idea where you were. You have no idea whose body you just woke up in. You have no idea where you are or what world this is or what time period or anything. And then you just have to like move your fingers, like, oh, I have fingers. You have to move your arm. I have arms. And uh, there's a sun here. There's light. And you just kind of like rediscover the world in this very innocent beginner's mind sort of way. It basically, all of these, what you're describing, just jars people out of their autopilot. This fog that we walk around in, and um, it's just a new way of seeing the world, and out of that, fresh ideas can emerge. By the way, related to that, I, I just read this yesterday. Uh, it's totally unrelated to meditation. Did you know that it's illegal in New York City to talk to people in an elevator? What? There's an actual law on the books... I forget what the fine is. Maybe it's like $25 or something. It's never been enforced. It, no one's <laughs> ever been arrested. or But it's actually just a law on the books that it's illegal to talk to people in the elevator because elevators used to be run by a guy who yes. would run the elevator. Yes. And people talk sometimes by flailing their arms around. And so you wouldn't want to hit the guy who uh, is managing the elevator in right there. The elevators were small. So it became illegal turn to someone and talk to them in an elevator. The antisocial part of me kind of likes that. Yeah, but now now what's interesting though is try talking to people in an elevator. It's that, that's a good meditation too. It's <laughs> it's it's an awkward thing. Elevators yeah. are weird. I think I think and this is nothing to do with mind it's a little bit mindfulness, but doing things that mildly take you out of your comfort zone, I yes. view as small meditations. I mean, for, for me, like there are a couple ways to define meditation. One is just sort of um, anything that gets you to pay attention to what's happening right now. That's a very broad definition of meditation. Another broad definition of meditation, you, you can argue about this till, till the cows come home, is training the mind. Mental training. You know, you, the, 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 the animating insight for me of my whole evangelical side hustle here uh, is that, that the science, the one thing we can take away from the science is that the brain is plastic, it has neuroplasticity. The, the brain and the mind are It's a recent trainable. discovery for yes. adults. The, the it used to be known for, for kids. teenagers yes. and kids, for babies and then for teenagers. These are the two, but now it's true for adults. That's right. So the received dogma in neuroscience circles for generations was that the brain stop, only just deteriorates. That's the only change you will see after something like the early 20s. Now we know that the brain and the mind are trainable. And that is really exciting. And, 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 and yes, formal medita mindfulness meditation is one way to do it, and I strongly advocate for it. But the, what you're talking about, which which probably don't, you know, aren't techniques that the Buddha was discussing, are nonetheless in this broad category of just training the mind in lots of di different directions. We can train the mind. <laughs> We're constantly training the mind, as a matter of fact, uh, um, blindly to want more dopamine and to um, uh, ignore whatever's right in front of us and to um, uh, um, hate people who we disagree with politically because we're on this kind of just in this kind of mindless default mode but but actually if you more are more intentional about it there are million there are tons of ways to train the mind all the things we want the most the kind of perspective that you've just been talking about the sort of fresh ideas spontane spontaneity gratitude, uh, calm, uh, one might say in, inner peace, self-awareness, compassion. These are all s mental skills. There, it's mm. not like we have factory settings that are like that we can't tinker with. These are these are uh, skills that you can train. To me, that is just a hugely liberating idea, and that's a little grandiose, but it just it, it happens to be true. And and let me ask you this: because uh, let's say you start any skill. It feels frustrating the first yes, year yes. because At least. you don't know if you're getting better or not. You mm -hmm. might, in fact, even be, quote-unquote, getting worse because you're trying to flail around and, and figure something out. So 
I'm not saying meditation's a skill. I'm not saying compassion's a skill, although, you know, they are muscles to be, compassion's a muscle to be exercised, and mm-hmm. meditation does that. When someone here is 10% happier, the one frustrating thing I could think is, man, I don't want to be 10% happier. I, I'm really down. I need to be 100% happier now. Yeah, well, uh, show me what's going to do that. You know, I mean, go drugs, go drugs, go buy a lottery ticket, but that's just not the way the world works. Um, I wish it was. It, it's just my experience. It's not, and it's very rare uh, that that something comes along and just makes you one hundred percent happier. Um, uh, there's a reason, you know. Cliches become cliches for a reason because usually they're true. Because there's a reason why the expression "be careful what you wish for" is around. And it actually taps right into the Buddha's concept of suffering. You know, Buddha gets a bad rap because the first thing he said after he became enlightened, if you even believe in enlightenment, was life is suffering. So suffering is actually a bit of a mistranslation for what he said. Basically, the long version of what he said is life is going to be frustrating um, if you uh, are completely yanked around by getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want. Um but but one way to ta- think about suffering is uh, in this context is that when we you know um, eat uh, the ice cream cone, when we get the promotion that we've long wanted, when we finally get a latte that we've been jonesing for, does that solve everything? No. I mean, we live with this lie that it will. You know, uh, if I finally like Bianca and I were finally crack this infertility nut and get a baby that well then we'll be fine well then the little dude doesn't sleep and you know well as soon as we sleep train him he's gonna be fine as soon as we don't you know i changed his diaper this morning as soon as he's uh, potty trained like then everything's gonna be you know rainbows and unicorns no that's just not the way the world works and w- for me the hack uh that the buddha came up with is actually having a sort of settled back um a mindful relationship to this constant seesaw of desire and aversion. And it's almost like the difference, and there's a subtle difference even in the words, but the difference between happiness and well-being. Yes. So yes. well-being doesn't necessarily imply happiness. It means you're you're well right now. Equanimity. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to put it in historical context, like forget about Buddhism for a second, but look at, at Buddha or however you say his name, Siddhartha, Gautama, or I don't know if that was his first name or last name. But, uh, no, you, you got it. <laughs> so, so he was a, a, a family member of a... Na- he had his grove where all his you know monks were and where he would meditate every day, and that's where they lived. There were three warring kingdoms uh, yeah. surrounding the grove, yes, yes. and he was a relative of the ruling family of one of the kingdoms. Yeah. So for him to be not stressed... Is kind of amazing because he was right in the center, unprotected, and the, at least two of the kingdoms wanted to kill him, probably. So I don't remember all of the details, and I I highly recommend if people are interested in the life story of the Buddha that you you investigate the books of a guy named Stephen Batchelor, who would, by the way, make a great guest. He's he's actually was on the podcast. Oh, he was after. After you you recommended him the last time, right? Okay. And by the way, I was a big fan of all his books, Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist. Yes, great. Great, because he sort of shows it's not... Buddha never talks about God. He just talks about what we've been talking yeah, about Yeah, Buddhist here. Atheist is actually just um, redundant. Yeah. Because Buddha, the Buddha, there is no deity, um, like a, a, a creator God in, in, in Buddhism. He's not but, like against it, but he doesn't talk about it. Yeah, it's just not, he's not, he's not, he, people ask him, you know, how did we get here? Why are we here? He's like, I don't, he didn't really have answers to that. But, but you've correctly identified the, the historical, this historical Buddha, what we know about him. He lived at a very tumultuous time historically, and he was hanging out with, you know, psychopathic murderous kings and um, and very, very rich people and he had trying to kind of negotiate peace in this context and also build his cadre of nuns and monks. And it was not an uncomplicated world in which he existed. And I think, especially when it comes to meditation, the way it's presented with these Buddha statues that you see at the spa and the airport, they seem like they've got the, you know, these beatific looks on their faces or I use a picture in my book of some dude with wavy hair sitting on a rock with yeah, wearing loincloth, you know, like that is not the deal. That is not the experience of meditation, nor is it what your life is going to become, some sort of frictionless um, uh, um, 
a bliss state uh, just because you've started to meditate. It's an unrealistic expectation. I think we just need to recognize that the world is, as I, as I said before, characterized by chaos and, and impermanence. And we just need to have a more seamless, supple relationship to all that. Uh, to me, as far as I can tell, you, you, you know, your listeners can tell me I'm wrong about this. That seems to be the recipe. Well, tell me about the app, the 10% Happier app, because yeah. I think still a lot of people have a hard time getting started. They're, they're, they're 40, 50 years into this really difficult thing called life, and for <laughs> to tell them, oh, now we're going to do something to completely uh, change the plasticity of your mind, it's like, whoa, how am I going to do that? And I think your app, you know, helps. So, so what is it? How do you get it? Yeah, so it's you know it's available wherever you get your apps. Uh, it's called Ten Percent Happier, um, and uh, you know I really think of myself as kind of a gateway drug. You know I I am not a you know I, I I've studied I've spent you know the last nine years studying meditation and and Buddhism and Eastern spirituality generally, and so I'm really interested in. It. I love talking about it. It's my favorite subject, but I don't pretend to be a teacher. But what I am is really somebody who can talk about. It, I hope talk about it in a way that you know gets. I'm a, I'm a non-traditional meditator, and I hope I can talk about it in a way that gets people excited to do it. And by the way, just to interrupt, in your book, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics, this is like the perfect book for what you just said. Like, for anybody who's ever had any doubts on meditation, there's so many techniques and ideas on how to view just the simplest meditation. 30 seconds, you know, here's one, smart compassion, 30 seconds or more, like, uh... Pro tip, give yourself permission to fail. I have that one earmarked. All these like great, su- just gentle suggestions just to g- and stories just to ease you into understanding that this is not like a, this doesn't have to change your whole lifestyle. You can just, you can start this. No one will know and, and it will change your life. Like you'll be 10% happier or more. I, I really appreciate you saying that. You actually, as we were taping this, the book hasn't even come out yet. So I haven't, met any human beings, many human beings who've act, who've read the thing, um, who aren't, you know, related to me. So it's just very interesting to hear what you're keying in on. But uh, just on the app, I guess the app is, uh, the app is the reason why I wrote the book. Because, so I wrote 10% Happier, and I had this very naive kind of cavalier attitude that, oh, I didn't think anybody was going to read it. But I, I thought to the, anybody who did read it would start meditating. Because I thought I made a good case in the book. The book is really... It's a memoir, but it's 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 actually an argument dressed up as a memoir. The argument is you should meditate, and the way I make the argument is just by telling my own story. But, but you tell the story intensely, so I mean, it's you're a storyteller. Yeah, and I think people. I what what I realize is that I think many people were reading it as a beach read, which is great. No, I, I'm I'm I was I'm super excited. It's all good, but I I, I think there were the, my mistake in the in the book because I didn't set out to write a memoir. My initial goal with 10% Happier is I was going to write the book I've written now, which is more of a how-to book. I ended up, the feedback I was getting on the early drafts was people just liked the story, so I just went in that direction. So I went and set up to be a memoirist. I'd never written a book before. It wasn't really in my wheelhouse whatsoever. I really just wanted to promote meditation. That was my that was my driving force. Um, so I, I after putting the book out, I got some feedback from some friends in the meditation world of like, hey man, you're getting people really excited about meditation, but you're not really telling them how to do it. Even though there were some instructions in the back of 10% Happier, they are kind of buried after the acknowledgments and they weren't extensive. So I started a company. I'd never, you know a lot about business. I didn't know anything and still very much a beginner. Um, but I started a company with some partners to teach people how to meditate. And that's that's what 10% Happier is, this app. And what we do is we bring in the people who I believe are the best teachers in the world. You know, scientists, you know, people who've had, also people who've had 40, 50 years of uh, meditation practice and teaching, including my my personal teacher, a guy named Joseph Goldstein, who's just the menchiest of the menches. He's just an, uh, an amazing guy. So famous not what, meditation teacher. F- yes, very famous meditation teacher, and not at all what you would think a meditation teacher is like. You know, he's just like a seventy year old Jewish guy from the Catskills who is very very funny and wry, and I really love him. And uh, so we so in, uh, basically, unlike most meditation apps where you just get a bunch of guided meditations, we are very video based. So um, you can do straight audio guided meditation from our teachers if you want, but most of our users actually watch a short two minute clip before they meditate where I'm ch- chatting with the teacher and it really brings the practice to life and um, it makes it fun and is super educational. These people are so damn smart. 
And uh, the other thing we do is that we give you a coach. So uh, a real live meditator, a human being, not a robot with whom you can text through the app if you have any questions. And the people who use that function are our most frequent and devoted users. How many users right now? 16,000. It's a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, we're a small company. We just started. Um, the last year, we've quadrupled. Um, it's great. We're really starting to hit our stride. I um, think for someone who hasn't done a business before, to just to still be in business after several years is, is a very great accomplishment. Yeah, and I will actually put 100% of the credit on that, on, on particularly my the CEO of the company. who's a young guy named Ben Rubin, who is phenomenal. We've become very close friends. And he had a pre-existing company that was teaching, who was doing sort of a whole bunch of mobile courses through a company called Change Collective. And uh, they were do, t doing mobile, uh, like a two-week course on how to have more gratitude in your life or how to go paleo or how to get up earlier. He came to me and said, will you do a meditation course with Joseph? So we did the course and it was so it was the most successful thing they'd done that I ended up joining the company as a co-founder, taking on a bunch of equity, investing in it. We raised more money from venture capitalists and so we're off to the races. And it has been just like an unbelievable adventure for me. So, so by the way, first, that's very sophisticated stuff you did, which is that you liked something, you provided a service, you invested in, you made a business decision, you invested in it, yeah. you started growing in it, you, you, you found a CEO to work with. Part of that, you, you have to attribute to meditation because identifying who are good people to work with, yeah. what are appropriate problems to solve, this is what's created out of that extra space you get when you are not ruminating down the rabbit hole about, oh, she said this at work, or he did this, or she did, did that. Those ruminations take up a lot of energy. Yeah, and I want to be clear, I still do that, I just do it less. And so that, yeah, there's no to way me, to solve. there's no way to solve all the problems. No. Because we're human. Absolutely. I, as uh, my friend Sam Harris likes to say about himself, I retain the capacity to be a schmuck. And that is true for me. And, and again, I ask my wife, um, so infallibility is not on the table. Is it, is like is it like matter meets antimatter when you go on Sam Harris's podcast? <laughs> Do people think you're related? <laughs> people think we're related all the time. Mm -hmm. We're very, we're actually quite close. Uh, we're very good friends, and he he's the one who introduced me to Joseph Goldstein because he's old friends with Joseph Goldstein. Sam, a lot of people don't know this, even though he wrote an excellent book about it called Waking Up. Sam is a long, long, long time meditator. Yeah, and he's been on this podcast. He, yeah, I mean, he—he's a controversial guy. People, some there are plenty of people who don't like him, and it's so funny when I hear from people who don't like Sam because of the Sam I know when I'm hanging out with Sam, it's usually with his wife, and his wife is amazing, and so our wives are friends, and you know, I know him as a guy, like a really as a, just a human, and he's goofy, and she's making fun of him, and just the way my wife is making fun of me, and but but that that is different from the Sam I think that that a lot of people perceive. Maybe, but you know, it's funny. I once saw him on, on Bill Maher and Ben Affleck was the other guest mm -hmm. on. And famous clip. Yeah, he has a famous clip. And Ben Affleck, whatever the political controversy was, I, I'm not even... Had to do with really Islam. Aware. Yeah, and uh, Ben Affleck's like yelling at him and yeah. Sam's just like sitting there looking at him. Like you could tell... He's got, he's just a calm. Yeah, he, he is. He meditates. And, you know, the calmness comes from somewhere or exercising some muscle. And meditation is that way of that exercising. Yes. That. Yes. So, yeah. It doesn't mean you have to agree with him and everything. And I'm sure there are plenty of areas where he and I disagree. It's just that, you know, I think actually this is a function too for me of meditation, which is I, over time, like I, I've, I've been able to really just get comfortable with disagreeing with people and doesn't mean that I. Um, yeah, life's not over. No, life's not over. I can still have a really, actually, cut quite, quite a deep relationship with people. Um, and also, you know, at this time in our in our country's history, I think it's really important that we have varied news and information diets. And so, I will listen to podcasts way across the political spe spectrum. For example, I'm a very frequent listener of Ben Shapiro, who's very controversial. I'm also a frequent listener of Pod Save America. Um, and I, and also, I'm a big consumer of the mainstream media, and I think right. And to me, it's all tied in in ways that I'm not sure I can articulate with the mindfulness, which is it's kind of seeing my own tendencies toward tribalism and seeing my own opinions and how maybe I don't like having them challenged, but then knowing actually there's something he healthy in doing that as being a good citizen. And I, I think, yeah, I'm kind of taking this far afield, but I, th no, I think no, there's I, something I, important there. I think that is, and I think having... I mean, I don't consume any news, so that's my way of dealing with it. <laughs> like, I zero know what's going on. 
this is embarrassing, and I haven't said this before to anybody, but like I kept seeing, you know, people talking about this guy Roy Moore, you know, when the election was going on. <laughs> and they were like, oh, he did some sexual thing, but I wasn't clear what it was. For maybe a month or two, I thought, oh, is he a baseball player or a football player? Like, that's just what I thought. I never, I didn't want to know. And then I found out, of course, as the elections got closer, oh, he's running for Senate. But uh, but that's the level of news I consume. It's so funny because my way of dealing with this, I think everybody's got ways of dealing with the current tumult. Uh, it, tumult? Yeah. I don't know if tumult. I'm pronouncing that correct. Tumult, whatever. I don't know what it is. Uh, my way, you know, so I've, I work in the news business, but frankly, I think left to my own devices, it wasn't a huge news junkie. What I liked about the news was the adventures. So for example, last night, but this is won't be last night anymore by the time this posts, but as we tape this last night, I did a big report on Nightline about Russia. I spent 10 days in Putin's Russia and really, oh, really? did all this crazy stuff. And for me, you know, covering war zones and I wasn't really up on every jot and tittle in the sort of UN debates over sanctions and in Iraq or anything like that. I just to me about about the experience. And however, with Trump, my response, and it wasn't planned, is just that I've actually I've found that having more information has really been um helpful to me it's not that i'm sort of over i don't think i'm overdosing on the thing but i I find being engaged and really being engaged across the ideological spectrum and trying to sort of understand i love one of the features they have on the new york times which you're probably not reading on their website they'll often compile writers from across the uh, ideological spectrum on the major news events uh, from the administration like the tax plan will go through and they'll put together what conservatives are saying and what liberals are saying and what centrists are saying. And I just find that being plugged in and having a sense of how things are going has actually just made me feel more connected and less dire than um, a news blackout might. But that's not to say I disagree with your tactic. It just no, hasn't worked I mean, for me. You, I'm probably wrong and people tell me, oh, you should be aware so you can engage where, where it's needed. Like, I sort of see a lot of news outlets as just trying to scare or just trying to appease one side or the other. So so unlike you, I don't take the time to go across all of them so I can get a balanced perspective. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I'm also not really aware of what I should be afraid of, which maybe you should be aware of it so you can say, okay, well, the worst case scenario is this. And so, so for instance, I know that a tax plan was passed. I have no idea what it means for anybody or anything or for me. My assumption is... It means nothing, just like almost every other tax bill that's ever been passed in history. So, and apparently it's the only law that Trump's passed in the entire time he's been president. So, okay, he's pretty ineffective and he's done zero vetoes and passed one bill. That's all I know about his entire presidency, other than the fact that he fires a lot of people and whatever. So, and here I am a year later, my life hasn't changed much, and I don't read the news. <laughs> I look, different strokes. Um, I, I, uh, I get it. I mean, everybody's got to find their own way of dealing with the toxicity of our domestic scene right now. And, but you and have to as, as your job. I, I do, that too. I do, I do. But I could, I could do less. You know, I could be doing less to eat and, and be fine in my job. It's just... To, for me, a feeling of having more information has been comforting for me. And the, one thing I'd say to people who are struggling with this, I've spoken to a lot of meditation teachers about sort of survival tactics for these kind of very, very divisive times, is the most constructive response is actually to figure out what is in your jurisdiction and do something. I, I agree. And I'll, I'll tell you a story about one podcaster I know, and I really enjoy this guy's podcast, and I've been on it. He wrote once, right after the election, he wrote, I am so upset and depressed that I'm stopping my podcast. And so I wrote to him and I literally said, are you functionally an idiot? (laughs) Um, Just compare two worlds. One is a world of uh, Trump, who you don't like, and now that world doesn't have your podcast. And another world has also Trump, um, and now it has your podcast. Which world is a better world that you would like to live in? <laughs> so he restarted his podcast to his credit. So yeah, yeah. so that's one way to, to look at things. But again, I think that's a way also too of like, uh, I'm not I'm not going to take credit for uh, for thinking this way. Although I don't know, but uh, I don't know you, you, you being tra- training your mind to look at 
scenarios and different from different angles is is helpful yeah. and that's what i think meditation in part does and just to be clear for me the problem isn't trump per se for me the problem is just how much antagonism there is in the right. atmosphere i agree with that i think the antagonism limits our vocabulary and prevents intelligent discussion it actually just goes back to everything we've been talking about this whole time which is it it just it's it, and this is again to just to amplify your point there is that it, it, it's constricting it's like it's horse blinders you just aren't you aren't you are in your own world where you're sort of partially you're not seeing the whole picture and what again what meditation is about uh, is insight seeing clearly and um i think that is the remedy for much of what ails us well that uh, and compassion you know i actually had a whole bunch of questions for you relating to productivity because you're so you have wear so many hats at abc plus your business plus all your writing and and meditation and i wanted to to talk about that because that's obviously we have a busier and busier world and fitting meditation into that and you write about that a little in your or a lot in your book but uh, I wanted to dive deeper into that. We're going to have to do another podcast about <laughs> all about just productivity. But I want to plug everything. First off, your new book, uh, again, Dan Harris with Jeff Warren and Carly Adler, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. So these are just great, mind-blowing, simple ways to get started in meditation and overcome any excuse you've ever heard. And I just, I just love every, I learned so much from just the way you put things made me think about meditation in different ways and caused me to, I mean, I have bookmarks all over. It caused me to stop and, and, and think about it. And this is a subject I've read a lot about and, and, and done a lot in. And, um, so there's meditation for fidgety skeptics. There's your original book, 10% happier. And by the way, when you talk about the concept of compounding happiness, I do think, you're happier than you the last time you came on the podcast. You yeah. seem more relaxed. Yeah. You seem more balanced in a lot of ways. It's hard to see that really, but I don't know. That's how it seems to me. And your app, 10%, um, 10 Happier, you can get it in iTunes, the Google Play Store, probably other places. Um, I wanna, I'm want i going to send that app to my email list when we send out, um, I mean, a link to the app when we send out... Uh, the notification of this podcast being released. I think everybody Good. should at least try it um, because Free it'll improve your life. So, so Dan Harris, again, uh, you know, we were talking earlier, like, why before the podcast started, you were, you were asking, why do I even, you didn't say it this way, but why do I even do this podcast? It's not like a big, uh, you know, it's not, for instance, a source of income for me, but I do this because I get to talk to Dan Harris, your 10% happier guy. And, anchor a co-host on nightline and anchor on good morning america it's such a pleasure to to keep getting to know you as we do more and more of these podcasts yeah, right back at you man you are really good at this and it's like uh, we had no idea what we we're going to talk about and it just just flows that is it's a rare gift so thank thanks so much Bravo. and 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 again next time you're on let's talk about productivity cool. but meditation for fidgety skeptics by dan harris thank you sir thanks again and if you like listening to this episode Subscribe to The James Altucher Show wherever you find your podcast, whether it's the podcast app on your phone or, I don't know, Stitcher or whatever, wherever else you find podcasts. Thanks. Next time on The James Altucher Show. For me personally, a sample size of one is the most important. Right. If something makes me feel good, it's probably good for me. If something makes me feel bad, it's probably bad for Especially me. Especially <laughs> since we're talking about food. I'm amazed sometimes at how many friends I have who are fit, healthy, everything's great. They go to the doctor, they come home, and they're like, my doctor told me I have to completely change what I'm eating. I'm like, why? You look great. Everything's fine. Why would you change a thing? There are people that can make claims all the time about these kinds of things, but there's no conclusive links. This is also where I would take a, take a deep breath. This is the healthiest the human race has ever been, ever. We yeah. live longer than ever before. People are dying of almost any disease you can mention at lower rates than ever before. This idea that somehow the food is poisoning us and we're all in mortal danger is, is somewhat bizarre. We're doing great. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? 
it's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.